Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session with the title Law in Action, Defending a Nation in Cyberspace. Joining me as the speakers are Jeff Kosev from the United States Naval Academy, Kenneth Kraszewski from the University of Helsinki, and Kadri Kaska from the NATO CCDCOE. So first, a few organizational remarks. Uh, I will introduce all of the speakers and the topics that they will focus on in their presentations. Each of the speakers has 15 to 20 minutes for his or her presentation. And after each presentation, we will take two questions related directly to that presentation, which should leave us with some time after all of the presentations where you can ask broader questions to multiple speakers at the same time. So uh, let's proceed with the first presentation. Uh, so I would like, if we would like to connect the title of this panel with the, with the presentation, I think that in the discussions whether and how international law applies to cyberspace, uh, people sometimes forget that it's the states and their policies that shape the law. And the states are testing the limits, and Jeff has written a great article about the US operational concept called Defend Forward from 2018, and what limits international law imposes on this operational concept. Thank you. Jeff, the floor Thanks. is yours. I'll try to get to the podium. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I have to give a few disclaimers first. I'm a lawyer, so I like giving disclaimers. I'll probably give a lot of them. Uh, first is that I'm speaking only on my own behalf, not on behalf of the Naval Academy, Department of Navy, Department of Defense, nobody else. Uh, the second is that I'm going to be talking about DOD operational concepts and strategies in cyber, uh, which obviously there is a good deal of classified material involved overall in cyber. That is not what this is about. Uh, this is all based on publicly available documents uh, through that DOD has released in media coverage. So uh, this is all public domain information that I'll be talking about. Uh, and the third, and this is really what I wanted to um, drive home what the overall topic of my paper and concept is, is that I'm not looking to have the normative discussion about whether defending forward is appropriate, or whether we should be. What I'm looking at as a lawyer is what are the limits on defending forward. Now, I think there are a lot of incredibly important normative discussions that need to be had, and I encourage all of you to have them. But what we're going to talk about today is what defend forward is and what international law allows. So um, as was said, I'm at the Naval Academy. I was a civilian, or I, I'm a civilian professor, but I was in pr the private sector uh, representing companies on cybersecurity matters. When I got to the Naval Academy, um, one thing that I learned is there are a lot of acronyms in the military. Uh, acronyms that I have no idea, I Google them all the time, uh, and they're actually useful. And the most useful acronym that I've seen is BLUF, which I had no idea what it meant until I got to the Naval Academy, um, and that's bottom line up front. So my BLUF for this presentation is that international law provides significant leeway for nations, including the United States, to defend forward in cyberspace. So uh, what I first want to do is talk about what Defend Forward is, because this concept came out a little over a year ago, and there was a big brouhaha in the press about what, what's Defend Forward? Does that mean that we're going to be uh, changing the rules of international law? And it's really much more nuanced and far less of a magnitude than was initially reported. So uh, to understand it, you have to first understand this concept of continuous engagement and per, or persistent engagement. Uh, those, that's really the strategy that came out through the Cyber Command's vision statement in 2018, as well as the DOD's unclassified summary of its um, cyber strategy. And what continuous engagement basically says is that we need to impose friction and costs on our adversaries. So that's the strategy of continuous engagement. Um, but how do we do that? That's where Defend Forward comes. And one of the things that Defend Forward has been referred to what is as, as a strategy, and it's not. It's an operational concept that supports uh, persistent engagement. And in the Cyber Command vision, uh, Cyber Command wrote that we want to defend forward as close as possible to the origin of adversary activity. And that's uh, rightly seen as a pretty big statement and a shift from previous statements uh, that the DOD has made in 2011 and 2015 in strategy documents, where it is focused on what's known as active defense or active cyber defense. Uh, and the key difference here is we're talking about being as close as possible to the origin. Uh, so 
what this strongly implies is not just looking at the DoD's perimeter, not looking once you get to the DoD network. Uh, now, where is as close as possible to the origin? Uh, there's not really a direct statement as to what that is. You could think it might be uh, within US, uh, other networks, non-DoD within the US could be uh, in the red zone uh, where, they're, where the uh, adversary is operating. It also could be in the zone of a third party where the adversary is operating. But it's clearly saying we're, we're going to look at other areas where we need to defend forward. Uh, now, the aims of defend forward, this was really articulated in this unclassified summary that DOD released of its cyber strategy. And that's, again, disrupting or halting the malicious activity, um, including activity that falls below the level of armed conflict. And that's key here. So I will be the first to admit, when I talk, when I teach about uh, international law applied to cyber, my go-to, my first instinct is to start talking about self-defense under USAID Bellum and uh, necessity and proportionality of self-defense, what's an armed attack, and those are all incredibly important discussions to have. But the reality that we're facing is that a lot of our threats are underneath this armed attack level, underneath the use of force, but that doesn't make them any less significant, and there's something that needs to be addressed. So that's clearly one of the issues that Defend Forward is looking at, is how do we address these sub-armed attack issues? Um, so that's what I want to do today, is talk about uh, the international law assessment of Defend Forward. Uh, so the clearest indication that I've seen publicly of what Defend Forward is came from a newsletter that Cyber Command's Public Affairs Office put out late last year, where it talked about three lines of effort of Defend Forward. Uh, positioning, warning, and influence. And so what I want to do is go through these three lines of effort and talk about what limits and what capabilities are permitted under international law. So the first line of effort is, a cons is called positioning. So that's talking about this forward cyber posture uh, that you can leverage to persistently degrade the adversary's effectiveness. Uh, and that, so that's the, that's the description. And I think it really needs to be broken down into two different activities to really do an international law analysis of it. Um, the first would be establishing that position. Uh, so what do you do to establish the position, whether it's just preparing, that would probably be the least, uh, raise the fewest legal issues, uh, all the way to leveraging that position, which might raise more issues that we have to deal with under international law. Uh, so if you're just establishing the position, some legal scholars might say, depending on what you're doing, that, that's going to be fine. We don't need to worry about the international law justifications. But if you're establishing a position, for example, by implanting malware, that could be seen at least by some as raising some sovereignty issues. Um, and th so, so that's, that's something that we really have to address. And then separately, what we need to address is if you're actually leveraging that position to cause harm, whether it's erasing data, um, make degrading the capability of a certain operation, that could be seen as raising some sovereignty issues. So how do we deal with that? If we're moving to a point where you could be dealing with some international law issues, and the clearest answer to this would be uh, countermeasures. So, and that this was um, discussed uh, in the president's uh, speech earlier today. Uh, I think countermeasures are increasingly being seen as an option to deal with all of these sub-armed attacks, sub-use of force threats that we're facing. And for many issues that the United States faces, countermeasures are a very a viable way to deal with them. So. Uh, there are limits on countermeasures. Uh, first is that basically you have to have, you can only exercise a countermeasure if um, the person who, if the state that you're targeting with countermeasures has committed an internationally legally wrongful act. And the goal of the countermeasure is to stop that violation. So um, you might first see this as being a significant limit, and in many ways it is. But given the nature of the threats that we're facing, the persistent uh, 
attacks that we're facing, I think it's probably less of a limit in a number of the situations that we're facing, because these are, the, these are constant attacks that are not stopping. The adversary is always trying to harm our networks, harm our systems, harm our data, harm our people. So the countermeasures, I think, more likely will be continuous. And I think this requires a bit of a shift from how we've thought about cyber legal issues before, where we've thought about them as these discrete episodic events, which in some cases they are, but in a lot of cases it's just gonna keep happening. So the countermeasures, uh, just as the attacks are persistent, um, the, I, I think the countermeasures also can have this continuous impact. Um, countermeasures also have to be proportionate. Uh, and so this does not mean that you have to, your countermeasure has to take the same form as the initial harm that you experienced. But the rough magnitude, at least the, under one, of, there are a few different interpretations of what uh, proportionality would mean, but the magnitude uh, has to be commensurate with the injury suffered. So I think that, that that's something that we always have to keep in mind, but I think again, depending on what level of countermeasures, I think that, could, that would be reasonable given the harm that we're suffering. Uh, the next line of effort is warning. So uh, the way that Cyber Command has defined it is enhanced warning of adversary actions, intentions, and capabilities uh, to better defend government and civilian networks data and platforms. So, this gathering information about cyber threats and using the information about cyber threats uh, would fall under the warning, the warning line. So a lot of warning, uh, a lot of what would fall under warning, I don't think would necessarily raise any significant concerns under international law. I would say if there's gathering open source information and I can, I, I think there, there's a lot that is available open source, and I think that would raise no concerns under international law. Uh, when we get to espionage, now that's where there's probably at least some controversy at this point. There's obviously no per se rule again, or that, uh, against um, peacetime espionage, although I would say once there's more widespread surveillance and data collection, there are at least some who might argue that that strays into the lane of uh, violating international law. Um, so I think it would, so, so depending on what form the information gathering is taking, that could raise some concerns. Also what would raise some concerns under international law would be if while gathering the information, uh, we were to cause damage to the systems. That at least uh, under some frames of analysis could create international legal issues. So um, that's also a limit to keep in mind when uh, conducting warning operations. Uh, the final prong would is, of uh, defend forward is influence. Uh, and the way Cyber Command defines this is encouraging stability by disabusing adversaries of the idea they can operate with impunity in cyberspace. Uh, so this, again, depending on what form it takes, um, a lot of the, th this could be anything from diplomacy uh, to sanctions to expelling diplomats, um, closing proper, cl closing embassies, those sorts of things. Uh, and those would all, I, I would say, um, fall under the category of uh, retortion, which are unfriendly acts that don't in and of themselves uh, raise legal concerns. Now, there are other ways to exercise influence that could be more creative. Um, for example, if there were to be a message, and that this is from public media, media reports, a message sent to individual cyber operators in other nations, not with a threat, but just a message, essentially letting them know that we know they're there, um, that also could be something that that would be influence. Um, I think just sending a message uh, and not raising a threat, I don't think that in and of itself would raise any significant legal concerns. Um, however, if you start threatening them, uh, th those sorts of things, that's where there could be humanitarian issues. Uh, so there would be some limits on that. Uh, obviously, if you influence by causing damage, as we talked about before, that would have to fall under law of countermeasures or any other legal justifications. So the bottom line that I wanted to, that I started with at the beginning of this talk 
is that there is significant leeway, uh, even though we're, if, even if we're not suffering an, or, or experiencing an, an armed attack or a use of force, there still is significant leeway to exercise measures to um, fight this persistent threat that we're facing. And I think Defend Forward is a very is a step in that direction of recognizing that we can't just have our legal analysis and our operational analysis look at sort of the the awful sort of Pearl Harbor cyber Pearl Harbor scenario uh, that's been talked about for years, which hopefully we don't experience. But instead, what we need to do is adjust both our legal and operational thinking to analyze uh, these persistent threats that we're facing. And I think that under international law, we do have, we, we obviously face limits, but we also do have significant leeway to address them and most importantly, uh, prevent them from happening in the first place. So uh, with that, I think that that's uh, what I have for now and happy to take questions afterward. So to give you some time to think about your questions, I already prepared one for, uh, oh, sure. for Jeff. <laughs> so um, my question is about justifying some of those uh, more intrusive activities as countermeasures, so mostly those positioning, uh, yeah. under positioning heading. So the countermeasures, they are defined in the articles on state responsibility, but I think uh, they are defined there pretty restrictively. There's a lot of conditions. Uh, they're made quite difficult to invoke. It's a self-help measure. And the UK Attorney General has already stated last year that uh, some of the conditions, uh, they just wouldn't apply to countermeasures when it comes to cyber operations. So do you think that the defend forward concept uh, will also have an impact on the opinion juris in the United States or, or elsewhere? I think so, and I, I hope so, because I think there, I, I agree with the UK Attorney General. I think the one of the big concerns was um, the notification requirement of having to notify of exercising countermeasures, and that clearly um, is not something that could easily be applied <laughs> in cyber. Um, I, but I, I also think that for some of the requirements for countermeasures, you could still comply, it's just rethinking how you frame it. So, for example, um, when the countermeasure is, um, has to be intended to cease the unlawful activity, if you look at it as, if, if you look at the unlawful activity as one discrete event, and that discrete event has stopped and isn't happening, then that might be difficult to justify. But if you look at what you're trying to stop as this ca continued campaign, I think that that's a way that would justify these more uh, these longer term countermeasures. Thank you. So, uh, okay, Przemek, <laughs> the, the guy in the fourth row <laughs> with the red ribbon. Uh, hi, my name is Przemysław Roguski. I'm a lecturer in international law at the University of Krakow, and I have uh, basically two questions which dig a little bit on the question of uh, sovereignty. So you you're saying about um, that the concept of defending forward can be justified by uh, recourse to countermeasures. However, countermeasures would presuppose, I would say, that you know this activity is considered as wrongful, uh, subject to to this um, you know justification of countermeasures. So, is your understanding of the U.S. position as implying that you know uh, the countermeasures can be taken only in in uh, response to a previous wrongful? Um, act or is it more to be read along the lines of what the UK uh, Attorney General has said that there is no question of sovereignty in cyberspace at all and therefore low level activities that would have been taken just don't fall into this category of countermeasures because they do not constitute a, a, a wrongful act in the first place. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's a good question, and I'm not, I, I'm, again, I'm not speaking for the United States position on anything. I'm speaking for my, my position on it. Uh, and I, I would say that um, d depend depending on what the act is, I, I, I might just have a different framing of what would constitute a sovereignty violation, and there's still, I mean, there, there are some people who would say that even um, interference in the elections uh, with, with um, interference in voting equipment, that sort of thing. Some might say that's not 
a violation of either sovereignty or non-intervention. I would strongly disagree with that. Um, so I, I still think that, I, I think you could reconcile the UK Attorney General's position, um, but not necessarily say that these are not sovereignty violations. So I, I think it, it partly depends on what the countermeasure actually is. Um, so the countermeasures that I would, I mean, if, if you start talking about actually uh, causing damage to equipment, I think that gets close enough to the line that I would, I, I'm a lawyer, so I tend to be risk averse. I would probably want to be able to justify that as a countermeasure, but I think it can be, is justifiable. Yes. So are you uh, mentioned in your speech about countermeasures such as uh, expelling diplomats, which would work against potential state actors, but uh, my question is, how would defending forward work in regards to non-state actors? And do you have like uh, an example of a countermeasure we can do um, when facing a non-state actor? Yeah. So I, I and I think that's going to I think that that's going to be uh, the topic uh, of the next presentation. So I'll I'll, I'll defer to my <laughs> colleague on uh, uh, on that. But but I I mean I think attribution is key. I mean I, I think be I think that that that's where um, you you need to have have attribution to be able to do that. I think we can take one more question. Uh, hi, sir. Cadet Brian McKenna, West Point. Um, one of the specific points you had was about a warning and gathering intelligence. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think that if, uh, say, the US with the defending forward were to uh, gather intelligence on foreign citizens without their knowledge in order to try to predict uh, an attack coming towards us, would that cross some line of an internationally wrongful act, or would that be OK? Gathering information on yeah, non-U.S. citizens who yes. are not in the United States. Yes. No, I mean that's we we do that. Uh, I mean we that that's uh, I, I mean that yeah I, I think that's I mean that's that would be espionage. That I mean we're I, I think that wouldn't for for me that wouldn't raise concerns. I think others might disagree with me on that point, but I, I mean I think just generally if it's just traditional signals intelligence. Uh, as long, if we're going after people, obviously, who are in the United States or who are U.S. persons, that's a whole different story. So thank you, and uh, let's uh, let's continue with uh, with the idea of law in, law in action. Uh, with, I would say that the issue with some publications on international law and cyberspace is that sometimes they are really thorough on the on the legal side. But uh, when you read them, you ask yourself, where's the, where's the cyber in it? Where are the facts? <laughs> uh, but that's why we like Kenneth's abstract and also the paper so much, because the legal analysis is so focused and relevant on one particular incident. Uh, he selected the Samsung incident, and he demonstrated how international law applied to it. So, Kenneth. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Kenneth Krzyzewski. I'm a doctoral student in law at the University of Helsinki as well as being just a regular corporate lawyer at a Finnish business law firm. Uh, the subject of my research is international law governing below the threshold of use of force cyber operations. Uh, I'm honored to be speaking before all of you today and uh, for the opportunity to learn from so many distinguished scholars and professionals in the cyber field. This is my first SciCon, so I'm very excited to be here speaking. The topic of my presentation today is the ransomware campaign that came to international attention in March 2018. At that time, the government of a major American city, Atlanta, was targeted by a sophisticated ransomware campaign. Atlanta's main court, called the busiest court in the American Southeast, was unable to validate warrants. Police officers were forced to, shut, uh, forced to issue citations by hand and the city's employment application portal was shut down. Most crucially, years of digital files were rendered inaccessible. The attack was costly. Its perpetrators demanded $51,000 to restore Atlanta's systems to full functionality. But the city followed the advice of federal authorities and refused payment. One month later, Atlanta had spent over $2.5 million to restore its systems, and an additional $9.5 million was later requested. However, Atlanta was not alone in its misery. The same hacking group and malware were implicated in attacks on hospital and health service providers and municipal governments across the United States. 
While other similar attacks like WannaCry, Petya, and NotPetya were much larger scale events, SamSam ransomware attacks also deserve an international law analysis. And because its effects manifested in a single state, that analysis is perhaps more straightforward. This presentation considers the attacks on healthcare providers and municipal governments through the lens of the Tallinn Manual. First, I will discuss the SamSam ransomware and the group behind it. Then I will explain how the incidents might be classified under international law. Finally, I will discuss the possible responses available to the United States. Uh, as you can see here on this slide, uh, there were many victims of these attacks. Primarily, the group targeted municipalities, such as uh, the cities of Atlanta, Georgia, Newark, New Jersey, as well as the Port of San Diego and the Colorado Department of Transportation. Also, healthcare providers were affected, specifically hospitals in Los Angeles, Wichita, Kansas, and Omaha, Nebraska, as well as some medical <coughs> services companies in Maryland and Illinois. In total, there were over 200 victims. Uh, US $6 million was made in ransom payments, and it, there were at least an additional 30 million in losses. The SamSam ransomware was unique in that it was directly targeted. The perpetrators chose, uh, specifically chose these healthcare providers and municipalities, and once they had access to the systems, they manually encrypted files. Uh, they then left a slightly apologetic ransom note uh, demanding several bitcoins in ransom. The ransom was set at an amount that would be deemed uh, affordable to the victims. Uh, initially, it was reported that the group behind it was uh, deemed Gold Lowell and was suspected to reside in Eastern Europe. Uh, however, on November 26, 2018, two Iranian nationals were indicted for the crime. Uh, not surprisingly, Iran has not extradited these individuals to the United States. For a cyber operation such as the SamSam ransomware campaign to constitute an internationally wrongful act, it must be a breach of an international obligation owed to another state, and it must be attributable to a state. Setting aside the question of attribution, attribution for a moment, I will first question whether the SamSam campaign was a breach of an international obligation owed by one state to another. In the cyber context, the most relevant breaches of international obligation are these four. Use of force, prohibited intervention, violation of sovereignty, and a violation of the duty of due diligence. Uh, I will examine the first three, but due to the time constraints of this presentation, I will omit discussion of due diligence, because that is a bit tricky to discuss uh, and, and doesn't apply to the SAM SAM attacks, because as we will see, no state is directly implicated. Uh, the UN Charter prohibits the use or threat of use of force by one state against the territorial integrity or political independence of another. While the threshold for what constitutes a use of force in cyberspace is unsettled, the Tallinn Manual proposes eight factors that states are likely to consider, which I will discuss in relation to the SAMSAM operations. Severity is considered the most important factor. And crucially, the overall severity of the SAMSAM attacks was low. While the potential for serious harm to result from the disruption of hospital and municipal services is high, in none of the incidents did such harm actually occur. Secondly, immediacy. The consequences of the SAMSAM attacks did not follow immediately from the cyber activities. In most cases, uh, the penetration of affected systems occurred weeks before the ransom notice was directed to the victim, and the monetary costs actually incurred by the victims to recover data and restore their systems followed weeks or months thereafter. Thirdly, directness. The effects of the SAMSAM attacks were not directly connected to the underlying cyber activity. While the attacks did have indirect consequences in the form of costs incurred to restore backed up data, and to implement improved security, the directness of the cause and effects is in no way comparable to the direct harm, for example, suffered by a kinetic explosion. 
Uh, the attacks were indeed invasive. Gold Lowell did invasively probe the networks of municipal governments and healthcare providers. However, these were not top secret networks and they were not necessarily intended to have the highest level of security. For instance, Atlanta's emergency response networks were not touched. Measurability of effects is also a problem with these attacks. Uh, the effects cannot be calculated with certainty, even if a numerical sum can be affixed to some of the costs to improve security in the future. Uh, there is no suggestion that these incidents had a military character. Uh, no state's military was implicated, uh, nor was the American military the target of any of the attacks. State involvement. No state is publicly alleged to have been involved, either directly or indirectly. And finally, presumptive legality. Uh, certainly the, the reconnaissance and network probing activities of the group are very similar to espionage. And espionage is not per se regulated under international law. So on, on consideration of each of these eight factors, the attacks fail to meet the criteria of a use of force. A cyber operation that falls below the use of force threshold may still be a breach of the customary international law principle of non-intervention. In the cyber context, the principle prohibits coercive in intervention by cyber means by one state into the in in internal or external affairs of another. Thus, an intervention consists of two elements. It relates to the internal or external affairs of a state, and it is of coercive nature. Samsung attacks do not contain both of these elements. While disturbing the operations of municipal courts and state transportation officials is clearly an intervention in the internal affairs of the US, it is not coercive in the strict legal sense that it was designed to compel the US to adopt policies regarding those particular internal affairs. It wasn't designed to compel the US to adopt a municipal court or transportation policies. It was designed to compel the US to pay money. Uh, the Sam Sam attacks could also be a violation of the United States' sovereignty. A vi violation of sovereignty can be either a violation of territorial borders or an interference or usurpation of an inherently governmental function. The Talon Manual proposes that causing a loss of functionality by cyber means is sufficient to constitute a violation of territorial borders. Sam Sam attacks undoubtedly did this. That was their whole purpose. Moreover, the attacks targeted inherently governmental functions, those of courts and of the police. Thus, it can be concluded that the ransomware campaign was certainly a violation of sovereignty. And if attributable to a state, it would constitute an internationally wrongful act, which then brings this presentation to a discussion of attribution. Uh, as we all know, attribution is especially difficult in cyberspace. But based on publicly available information, we can rule out that the Sam Sam attacks uh, were either the acts of state organs or were the acts of state organs placed at the disposal of another state. However, it, it is still possible under international law that the acts of non-state groups can be attributed to a state under certain circumstances. Acts by non-state actors are attributable to a state if the non-state actor is acting on the instructions of a state or acting under the direction and control of a state. Uh, this latter implies that the state determines the execution and course of a cyber operation and has the authority to order its commencement and cessation. Now, as I keep saying, as far as I can determine from publicly available sources of information, as I am just a civilian lawyer and don't really know what is going on behind the scenes, uh, Gold Lowell was not acting on the instruction or under the direction and control of a state. So we're not able to attribute its actions to a state. Because I have, uh, hopefully I have established that although the attacks were a violation of US sovereignty, they are not attributable to a state and cannot be considered an internationally wrongful act. So what are the possible responses of the United States? International law provides uh, four general possibilities. 
countermeasures, the plea of necessity, self-defense, or taking action in self-defense, and retorsion. Countermeasures are unlawful actions, but for the fact that they are taken in response to another state's internationally unlawful act and are designed to terminate that act or compel the attributable state to make reparations. However, the, the object of countermeasures must be a state, and it is not possible to attribute the SAMSAM attacks to a state. There must also be an internationally wrongful act to justify countermeasures. And even if there was in this case, countermeasures have to be limited to ensuring that the unlawful act stops, uh, obtaining assurance, guarantees of non-repetition, and compelling the responsible state to make reparations. You cannot take countermeasures uh, for a purely punitive or retaliatory reason. Uh, the U.S. would be wise to avoid taking countermeasures in this situation, as by doing so, it would itself be in violation of international law. The plea of necessity is likewise not available to the United States in this situation. Uh, the plea of necessity can be asserted to take action against non-state actors, and it can justify actions that violate the rights of non-responsible states but only if the, threat, uh, if the threat to the injured state is sufficiently grave and imminent, and there are no other means of safeguarding uh, that essential interest. State attribution is not a precondition for taking action based on the plea of necessity. What constitutes a state's essential interest is not clearly defined, but it would certainly include uh, the sort of things that were affected by the SAMSAM -SAM attacks, like healthcare, justice, and policing. However, it is unlikely that uh, a temporary interruption in the functionality of these systems in just a few cities uh, is sufficient to put those essential interests in grave and imminent peril. And it is also unlikely that the U.S. Uh, would have no other means uh, to safeguard those interests. And finally, in any case, the ransomware attacks have stopped, and the plea of necessity can only be invoked to end the harmful activity. The third uh, response possibly available to the US is taking an action in self-defense. This is probably the least viable option. Under Article 51 of the UN Charter, a state may respond with force to a cyber operation that qualifies as an armed attack. Uh, there's some dispute between states as to what constitutes an armed attack. Uh, the majority view is that only grave uses of force are that, but uh, the U.S. has consistently held that any use of force is an armed attack. Since we are talking about the United States, that is the view that is relevant, but even under that view, uh, the Sam Sam campaign can't be considered a use of force, and so the U.S. may not respond with force in self-defense. Which brings us to the only uh, viable option, which is retortion. Uh, retortion is lawful retaliation in kind for another country's unfriendly or unfair action. It is the best legal response available to the United States in dealing with the Sam Sam attacks. Uh, acts of retortion are lawful, although unfriendly. For example, a state may respond uh, by suspending diplomatic relations, restricting tra travel rights, or expelling foreign nationals, or preventing the use of its cyber infrastructure for communications. Retorsion is the only way the U.S. can really respond to the Sam Sam ransomware campaign without a determination that another state has breached an international obligation owed to the U.S. The Sam Sam ransomware campaign disrupted healthcare organizations and municipal services in numerous locations across the U.S. Undoubtedly, the actions were malicious cyber operations carried out by foreign actors, implicating the rights of the U.S. under international law. But to be considered internationally unlawful acts, the ransomware campaign would have to constitute a breach of an international law obligation. The attacks were neither uses of force nor coercive interventions, 
And while violations of US sovereignty, the attacks are not attributable to a state. Thus, the attacks do not qualify as internationally unlawful acts, and it limits the possible recourse for the US. As we have seen, countermeasures, the plea of necessity, and self-defense are not suitable responses. Retorsion is the only legal response available to the US. It's not a particularly satisfying outcome and demonstrates the difficulty faced by states in using international law to respond to modern cyber attacks. Uh, Thank you. That is, <laughs> ends my presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I actually have a, have a question on one of the topics. So, um, when you considered uh, if the incident was a prohibited intervention, you came to the conclusion that uh, while it did implicate the internal affairs of the United States, it was not coercive. Uh, so could you please elaborate a little bit on that, uh, assuming that we can attribute the incident if a state uh, demands ransom from another state, uh, uh, like from, 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 its, from its budget, uh, isn't that uh, clearly coercive? Yes, well, to, to be considered a coercive intervention, you have to intervene in the internal affairs in a coercive manner. So what you're trying to compel the state to do is to modify those internal affairs. What happened in this case is the perpetrators sought money. To be a coercive intervention in municipal affairs or you know, traffic affairs, they would have to be seeking to force those cities to take particular policies regarding traffic or healthcare, not simply seeking money. Great. Thank you. So, uh, questions from the audience? Hello, thanks a lot for the, for the presentation. My name is Tilman Rodenhäuser from the International Committee of the Red Cross. I would have a question. You said you, you did not mention due diligence, but to me a situation where we have a non-state actor operating from one state um, and no, it's not attributable to any state. If you think about responses and responsibilities, I think due diligence is actually quite pertinent and I would be interested to hear your views, um, especially with regard to what means or what, what responses are available to a state if another state is not willing to, to halt these wrongful acts by non-state actors? Thanks. Yes, I, I didn't, uh, thank you for the question. I didn't discuss due diligence because it, it's particularly complicated and I, I didn't want to spend so much of the presentation speaking about due diligence. But uh, the, the problem here for me is it, it's not clear or when I was writing the article, it wasn't clear who perpetrated these attacks. So I had to speculate a lot about what state the US would have to ask to take actions to stop these attacks. I mean, the, the obligation of due diligence is that if you are aware or reasonably should be aware that actions are emanating from your state that implicate the rights of another state, you, as the uh, territorial state, have an obligation to end those actions or to you know, take reasonable efforts to end those actions. So it, it wasn't clear to me whether, uh, and I discussed this a bit in my article, but it wasn't clear whether the United States had asked any other state to take actions to stop those, whether any territorial state, I, I guess Iran in this situation, whether Iran had agreed to take actions had taken actions and just failed to stop them, had refused to take actions, or, you know, there, there's a lot of possibilities of what could have taken place, and none of it is publicly available. Yes, one more question. Hi, thank you. Uh, Raquel Garbers, Department of National Defense, Canada. I'd actually like to ask the first presenter a comment about the second presenter's um, argument. When the second pre presenter sort of worked through the possible responses, right, you can see that they are all uh, designed to make an action, uh, a sort of discrete action finish. Uh, it's retaliation in kind. So it's all very 
circumscribed and extremely limiting um, yeah. from a deterrence perspective. So given that construct, in that example, how would you reconcile that with your position that there's significant leeway for states to take action? Yeah, so I think that, uh, I, that that's a really good point, and I think that it really depends on what the, what you're trying to, what you're going after, and what you're trying to respond to. So, this is a fairly discrete incident. Uh, what I'm looking at are the continuous campaigns. I would say uh, one would be Russia uh, with election interference, uh, perhaps China's. Uh, attacks on US companies and their intellectual property, that would be something more that is something that we see continuously. I think this, the Atlanta incident, this was something where it, I, I would say was more episodic, which uh, I, I think we, we discussed, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that I, I think you're exactly right that once there once there is a pattern and if we I mean, part part of it does get to the attribution and see what source it's coming from. So uh, just the fact that we've ha had a few ransomware incidents that I don't think would necessarily be a pattern that would allow this continuous uh, <clears throat> response. So I mean, a lot of it really does depend on the intelligence that we're gathering about where this is coming from and whether it is episodic, whether it is a continuing pattern and whether it's ceased. So, I mean, I, I think it really does require an evaluation of the circumstances. So, I think it's time for the third presentation. Uh, one of the main postulates of Tallinn, Tallinn Manual 2.0 is that each state has territorial sovereignty and exercises jurisdiction over the cyber infrastructure in its territory. Uh, so it's both in its interest and its, uh, its right to prevent adversary activities in its territory. And the advent of uh, 5G networks will lead to an even higher risk of these adversary activities. So Kadri, as the lead author of a recent CCD COE paper on 5G, is uh, best suited to talk about the issues raised by this technology. Kadri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tomas, for the, for the introduction. And, uh, and a very good afternoon from my side as well to all of you. Uh, well, actually, when uh, when Tomas approached me with a with a proposal to discuss uh, on the Steichen stage the uh, how international law uh, is uh, operating in action in in dealing with the uh, mundane realities of, of real life, I, I found the idea rather intriguing. But I must must also admit that uh, whatever title we conjured up, uh, we are definitely not striving to conceptualize uh, sort of new thought. Uh, for supply security, it's rather really, um, what I would like to do is contextualize uh, international law in action uh, against the, a particular case, which was, uh, which is the, uh, the looming or, or, uh, or awaited deployment of, uh, of 5G networks and uh, which is hence not an incident, not an uh, existing or, or uh, happened uh, operation, but, uh, but a risk arising of a potential reliance of a supplier uh, in awareness of uh, the context of that supplier uh, coming from an uh, autocratic system of an adversarial uh, state. So, uh, so I would uh, first, uh -huh, I have this little thing here. Uh, what I would first do is uh, give you an, uh, an, sort of an overview of that, of that mundane reality. So uh, the 5G study that we uh, published this year together with our esteemed moderator and another colleague of the CCDCOE, and, uh, which was called uh, Huawei uh, 5G and China as, the sec as a security threat. And then uh, uh, by means of introduction, really, rather than, uh, than an in-depth uh, analysis, which I think, or uh, consider the, the previous speaker, uh, 
provided a very good example of, of taking an actual case and putting it through the, the, the various legal tests. But uh, I will merely refer to the, the international law uh, frameworks we analyzed uh, and, and uh, found applicable, and then, uh, then discuss our sort of broader reflections on the on the role of uh, and on the expectation of the on the legal uh, expertise, legal experts, especially when, when it comes to uh, the realities that uh, are faced by the by the legal uh, legal community and not just the legal community in small states. And let's let's face it, uh, small states make up about uh, uh, two thirds of both NATO allies and uh, and EU member states in our context. So. Uh, so what's the uh, what's the West's issue with 5G and uh, and Huawei exactly? Uh, we've heard that throughout the course of this uh, the drafting process, we heard the question uh, ad nauseum really: What is why is Huawei an issue if there is no uh, smoking gun? And uh, so, and also by means of sort of. Scoping, uh, we did discuss really the, the or analyze the 5G issue alone. We didn't venture into and, and the and the current debates in uh, regarding the U.S. Uh, executive order around uh, Huawei's broader product range, where we're not in our scope, so I will not touch upon that. But we looked at the, at uh, Huawei as uh, 5G supplier from uh, three angles. So first, uh, the role of 5G in our uh, or expected or envisioned role of 5G in our increasingly digitally dependent societies, especially looking into the future and, uh, and uh, the role 5G is expected to have, uh, admitting that no one can quite imagine the, um, what the ecosystem of new products and services and processes will look like and lead to. Uh, then, uh, secondly, we looked at Huawei's uh, uh, current contested position in the market, and the factors that have brought it there, as well as its uh, its track record of date uh, to date of uh, of engagement in uh, in uh, cyber espionage or or uh, or economic espionage, and then finally we looked at uh, China's legal and political environment, its uh, economic uh, or pattern of economic cyber espionage and uh, with acknowledging that economic uh, capacity uh, has uh, for, a, for a while really uh, been, or for a long time been China's preferred means of, or to achieving and exerting uh, geopolitical influence. So, so why, why 5G, why the attention? Uh, Especially for the for the legal and policy community, 5G is a sort of for many of us the, the 5G term is something floating in the air, perceived as something that that will at some point bring us uh, better uh, data speeds. But it's it's one thing is very clear: it's not just uh, better for 4G. I wish we had time for the for the nice uh, video we, we presented at the at the report launch, but uh, but there's plenty uh, plenty of good material to illustrate the sort of the diversity and the and the, the capacity of uh, of the potential five five G solutions. I do recommend to uh, to look them up if you're interested in, uh, in getting a better glimpse of uh, of the looming future. Uh, we are we are talking about uh, when we talk about 5G, we are we are talking about a qualitative jump. So, uh, uh, lower latency, bet meaning better connection times, the possibility to simultaneously connect to more devices, and uh, more versatile versatile devices, products, solutions uh, from all domains of human life: media, medical, uh, transportation, education, government functions, whatnot. So uh, it's not an exaggeration to consider 5G as the, really the, the digital nervous system of our increasingly digital societies. And, uh, and from a cybersecurity point of view, we can, we can be pretty much assured that, uh, that the old or the, 
the ecosystem in a sense will not go undergo a fundamental uh, change, meaning that anything that can be abused or used can, uh, can also be uh, abused, meaning that all those uh, cool gadgets and, and processes and, and services will be both targets and uh, potentially also means of, uh, of uh, cyber attack, cyber operations. So, uh, due to such uh, integrated role of 5G networks in the, in the society as an enabler and for, for societal and economic and governance functions, uh, it will be a communications infrastructure essential for the functioning of our uh, contemporary societies. And it will bear uh, dependencies and dependence risks for, for not just the communications sectors, sector, but all all other interconnected and, uh, and interreliant uh, sectors, inclu including those cross-border. So, and of course, once installed and, and deployed, uh, or once you opt for a certain technology, uh, the decision to simply revert or uh, switch to another provider and another uh, type of solution uh, may not be uh, may not be something that is easily done. The cost may be prohibitive. It may or it will uh, probably require uh, changing architecture and, and other complications like that. So uh, so the choice is really considering the the significance of uh, of the new generation of communications networks for for the society. The it it can't really be viewed as a as a merely technocratic. Uh, step or decision, the, the, the risk assessment and the, and the risk understanding has to be, has to be done earlier, or before, before the critical decisions are taken. So why Huawei? Um, uh, the company has, over the recent years, uh, grown into the, the largest telecoms uh, provider uh, or telecoms uh, equipment manufacturer globally. It is currently the only company that can uh, provide all the elements of a 5G network at, uh, at cost and scale, uh, meaning the, its closest competitors can, uh, can provide um, so segments or can, can provide uh, elements of, uh, of 5G networks, but not the entire range. And, uh, and it has uh, very clearly stated its ambition to acquire uh, market uh, dominance in, uh, in provision of uh, 5G services. And, uh, and equipment, and uh, and Huawei and other Chinese uh, uh, telecoms uh, companies also have uh, gained rather significant role also in 5G standards development. So, in when in four uh, or two and three G uh, communications networks, their role was uh, was marg marginal, if even that. Uh, it has grown with uh, with 4G. And uh, with, uh, now with uh, 5G standards and intellectual property rights, they, they hold, uh, Chinese companies hold about one, uh, one tenth of all the, all the critical or core standards, and, and Huawei has the largest proportion of it. And uh, so why the fuss? Um, the main claim, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning of the skeptics, has been that uh, today there have been no significant exploitable vulnerabilities in Huawei uh, uh, in any of Huawei's products, uh, and, and that means that no, uh, we, we cannot really talk about an incident, or we cannot talk about an uh, on an uh, operation that has been identified. Uh, and it is important that we dis distinguish between an actual breach uh, and evidence of an actual breach and the risk of a breach or expectation exploitation, so we are not uh, talking about responding and the op options to respond to an actual incident. We are talking about uh, risk assessment and uh, feasible risk assessment measures to which uh, the legal frameworks that th set their limits and to which the legal advice has to be sort of has to be aware of and, and has to has to recognize. So um, what we do know that is that uh, Huawei's uh, track record in, in terms of cyber and econ economic uh, cyber espionage is not exactly blameless. There's quite a few uh, or a few court cases in the U.S. There, there's ongoing or, or court convictions also in, on, uh, in earlier years. There are currently uh, 
Canada and Pol Poland have uh, detained Huawei's uh, employees uh, alleged for alleged uh, cyber espionage and, and breaching uh, sanctions regime. Uh, so, so it's uh, in a sense we we have seen the we have the, seen we see the pattern of operation. Uh, we know the capacity and the the ambition, and that sort of, sort of even for the legal advisor has to work or or lag somewhere in the in the back of their mind when they when they also considering this issue from a, from a risk basis. And then, of course, we have the recent, in terms of product security, we have the recent uh, uh, report of the UK Cybersecurity uh, uh, Evaluation Centre. Uh, which uh, stated that they uh, they have uh, found significant te technical deficiencies in, in some of Huawei's products, and they uh, or even the, the sort of production chain, and they cannot uh, uh, offer uh, concrete or they can only pro provide limited limited assurance that. Uh, the risks to UK national security from Huawei's involvement in uh, in uh, UK's critical networks can be sufficiently mitigated in the long term. And then we have the we have the sec uh, security environment. Uh, we know that uh, economies, uh, China's preferred approach to exerting strategic uh, influence globally. Uh, we know that the country has pursued uh, persistently. Uh, a technological superiority or self-sufficiency agenda over the about the past decade, investing uh, heavily into its tech uh, sector, its R&D, uh, subsidizing uh, the technology sector uh, and the, the communication sector, in uh, or in particular within that, and we know of existing market barriers to uh, foreign providers, which give uh, the local. Uh, local economy and lo local uh, suppliers uh, clearly unbeatable economies of scale, considering the, the the scope of the Chinese market. And then there is the legal and political environment. Uh, there is the uh, the Chinese national intelligence law of uh, 2016, which requires all uh, companies to support and provide assistance to and cooperate in national intelligence work and uh, guard the secrecy of any, any such uh, intelligence work that they are aware of. And then the promise and the legal guarantee from the state that the state uh, shall protect individuals and organizations that support and uh, cooperate with uh, and collaborate with in, uh, or in nas national intelligence work. And a similar provision exists in, uh, in national uh, counterintelligence law, which uh, requires all domestic uh, companies and individuals and, uh, and entities to provide information uh, and facilities and other assistance uh, to, the, to the state uh, in, for, for the purposes of counterintelligence and, uh, and uh, man mandates or prohibits uh, those uh, uh, entities of, uh, of uh, refusing uh, cooperation. So uh, taken together, the, these acts don't really leave much assurance regarding judicial or public oversight uh, to constrain the introduction, introduction of back backdoors into, uh, into the 5G solutions should the state deem this necessary for, for the broad notion of, of maintaining state security. And of course, uh, given the, the given the political context, uh, where such requests are, are normally complied with rather than uh, contested, and uh, I, I've grown up in an autocratic regime, so I know that the civil disobedience is not really uh, something you contemplate too heavily in uh, in, a, in a system like that. So the, the companies are normally not inclined to or or to not uh, comply with uh, such requests. So where does it leave us in terms of international law? Uh, to pull the pyramid together, uh, the primary risk of, uh, of using Chinese uh, 5G technology comes from the, 
uh, influence ex exerted over Chinese uh, companies by their government and military, and uh, the, the criticality that 5G uh, is expected to have to the to the functioning of our of our sort of social society, uh, societal and, uh, and economic uh, system. So uh, we know that the capacity is there uh, to conduct cyber operations. The conducive environment is there. We know the track record, and uh, but we still lack the smoking gun. So one could. Uh, ask what assurances the international law uh, and treaty regimes offered to constrain China's potentially malicious uh, behavior. And uh, we, uh, I th the previous uh, speaker again uh, outlined the, the examples and, the, and sort of the walkthroughs pretty, uh, pretty systematically and clearly for, for all of us. So the honest answer is, uh, when it comes to dealing with risks, not much. We know that acts of espionage are normally pun punishable, uh, punishable under domestic law. We know that international law, uh, public international law, doesn't really address those issues much, unless the particular operation or the particular activities uh, breach uh, or, or certain thresholds or consti constitute malicious uh, or prohibited uh, a breach of international obligations per se. All, uh, all of those require uh, a certain sort of coming over a, a certain uh, certain threshold, uh, require tangible effect, and uh, require clear state involvement. So to the stage where we are still talking only about a risk rather than a, an actual uh, incident, uh, we uh, we have a toolbox. But we really need for a, sort of the risk to materialize before we can start drawing upon that, uh, that toolbox to respond. And for um, uh, most countries, or if not all of them, this is not really where we, where we want to go. So, uh, and I will hop over this, but the, I think that given the slides will be available later, uh, the, sort of the, the outline of the division of the national responses is, is there. So, uh, so where does it uh, where does it leave us as the legal community and the national legal advisors uh, in terms of being able to offer uh, credible legal tools and legal uh, advice to our our governments, especially. Uh, where we are facing a situation where we, uh, where we are becoming increasingly aware of the risk, but, and we know that the risk mechanism uh, must be supported by national law, but, we, but the international mechanisms don't, don't really support us much. Uh, somebody has wisely said that if we are looking for the smoking gun, and if you if 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 can actually see the smoking gun, it means that we've probably already been hit, or very, very likely. So, uh, So we, uh, sort of summarizing, we really need, especially as a, as a coming from a small state again, uh, we cannot really afford this, uh, this division of competence where our legal experts on the one hand are well trained in international law and our policy and our technical uh, and, and national cybersecurity strategy is driving us in a, in a direction where we are uh, aiming to invest more into resilience and, uh, and preventing and, uh, and improving our defenses. So we, the legal community has to offer uh, strat strategy uh, and, and policy makers uh, with credible options. And I've, uh, especially from sort of my, my a bit of a blended role of a, of a legal uh, researcher at the CCD COE and uh, having uh, fairly recently for, uh, for the Estonian uh, National Cyber Security Agency, we see that we are, as the legal community, we are often providing tools that are intellectually stimulating, but that the, the practitioners and the, and the national uh, sort of cyber security uh, strategy really cannot, uh, cannot draw upon. And again, the small state reality is that you probably cannot function in a setup where, where you have the, a piece of expertise a uh, piece of uh, detail specific expertise in uh, in one house 
and uh, in international law, and then maybe on, on international trade law or, or the network and information security uh, uh, directive in another house, and, uh, and intellectual property or, or also data, data protection law in a, in a fourth house, and, and hoping that these will, uh, these will like, in a sense, combine uh, provide meaningful and working answers to the to the national resilience building efforts. So, uh, so I'm I would really advocate for rather than viewing this as a comprehensive issue, meaning the sum of uh, of individual elements, we really need to become better in terms of integrating the legal expertise, but also integrating in uh, in how uh, lawyers are able to advise. Uh, Strategy, strategic level of a nation, and, and the policymakers, as well as the technical community. So the sort of the the integrated learning process, where lawyers become better digitally literate, and uh, and the technical community understands the basics of the law, is uh, is something that uh, that bears a more more practical significance for in our our work as the as the center of excellence as well. So sorry for for keeping your attention for for so long and taking away for or sort of snatching your chance to uh, your time to ask questions. But uh, hopefully we'll have time to discuss in the in the following session. Thanks very much. So I will actually follow up on your main conclusion, and um, you, as the main editor of the recent Center's paper on trends in international law, uh, are also best suited to answer my question about the future. Uh, so, do you see uh, like a com common approach or a common policy crystallizing internationally among among various states, or is it more of a situation of fragmentation uh, when you for example look at the EU uh, negotiations or EU, EU developments in this regard uh, I, I would like to uh, know your opinion about about possible like, developments also with regard to international law uh, based on this I think I'm still stealing question and twisting the angle of it I, what I uh, what I think I see is a capacity gap Mm -hmm. We have uh, we have the example of uh, of the U.S. and uh, and large European allies that are investing heavily in also uh, upgrading and and uh, sort of pushing forward or pulling forward the international law discussion by by state practice, and then we have uh, we have a, the majority of the countries in the world. Who, are, who, who will never rise to that scale? Also, in terms of expertise, being very li reliant on the on the bigger allies, which is a strength of the NATO alliance on the, on the one hand, but it also means that uh, the realities and uh, sort of the playground is defined by by larger actors, and the smaller states have uh, have difficulty uh, meaningfully and responsibly operating operating in that. So uh, I, I'm not sure it by far answers your your question, but this is uh, this is the sort of the concern that I've had watching this discuss discussion roll out. Yep. Thank you. So uh, uh, questions from the audience. Oh, Kubo <laughs> Machak. Thank you. Thank you, Kadri, for your really thought-provoking uh, and very interesting presentation. And it's uh, uh, so. My name is Kubo Machak, University of Exeter. Uh, and it's really nice that we have both, or two of the authors, two of the three authors, so Tomasz, feel free to chip in as well. For me, one of the very interesting conclusions of your report was that Western states, and I think I quote almost exactly, that Western states are in principle free to ban Chinese products, including the products uh, by uh, Huawei. And so I, I just wanted to to, to see if you could tease out a little bit more the implications of this and the analysis of, of, uh, of this uh, conclusion from the perspective of international law. I think in the report you say that this would be subject to uh, the relevant international trade law exceptions and then you, su then you suggest that it's the, the essential security interest exception that would apply. But I would put it to you that that exception under international law is very, very restrictive and you would be able to identify basically 
that this would relate to measures taken in a situation of an international emergency. And so I was just wondering how you were thinking about this particular issue, uh, if it would come to that, that some states would decide to take uh, up your conclusion on this particular legal matter. How would they justify it under the applicable international trade law framework? Thank you. Shall I take it? Sure. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, uh, you can, you can possibly, uh, probably suspect that we didn't have an international trade lawyer. Also, the limitations of, the, of small states in the, in, the, in the drafting group of the report. What we, uh, what we, the conclusion we, we reached was that in, in broad terms, the, by means of exercising sovereignty, states are also free to choose the, essentially the, the critical how they lay out or whom they accept in the market as critical for, for the purpose of critical comp components of their fundamental infrastructure. And then subject to um, multilateral and bilateral uh, trade agreements, which uh, of course uh, sort of do put or do uphold the national uh, security clause Pretty, in pretty straightforward terms. The particular uh, provision of, uh, of the GATT that we referred to it was, uh, according to our uh, findings, uh, uh, deliberately phrased in a, in a broad and inclusive manner, so, uh, so only uh, blatant examples of, uh, of sort of misuse of that provision would, uh, would fall outside of its scope. So everything that remotely looks like a national security interest uh, can pretty plausibly be, be uh, considered or sort of taken into, into that exception. But of course, this is where we, uh, this is pretty much where our insight stopped because we, uh, we were really breaching the, the surface in, the, in that discussion and didn't, uh, didn't explore much further, especially as the sort of, what I appreciate about the or appreciate about the European approach is that the, there is more uh, the emerging consensus seems to give uh, more room for uh, for sort of uh, conscious uh, risk management, allowing to take those different uh, economic and social uh, interests into into account next to the security interests. Any more questions? Call on some midshipmen if you want. Hmm? I could call on some midshipmen if you want. No. <laughs> Shall I? Yes. Sure, yeah, of course. Yeah, now it's now. Yeah, because, yeah. because yeah. I love that. So, 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 once again, uh, so coming back to, to the Samsung uh, example and uh, the, the link that, that, uh, that has been proposed between you know, persistent engagement and, and, and Samsung. So let's, let's do a hypothetical. Let's, let's hypothesize that um, the US would have established which command and control server is responsible for spreading this you know, Samsung mal malware. Uh, would it be covered under persistent engagement if the US, for the US to go in and turn that server off? if it was in red space, let's say in Iran, or gray space somewhere in Zimbabwe, let's say? And if yes, what would be the, uh, the, the, the legal justification under international law for, for doing that? Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think obviously it would be very fact specific and it would look at issues such as what other harms were being caused and so forth. and. Um, is it continuing to be used? Because again, the uh, the one, one of the limitations is to have them cease the unlawful action. So I think there are a lot of very specifics. I think it could be uh, as as a countermeasure. But I, again, I, I mean, I think you're moving toward a justification for that. But I think we would need a lot more facts for that. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs>